We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. It's a crooked system, folks. It's a crooked system. Can you picture my prophecy? Human rights are in peril. Stress in the city, the cops on top of me. The project is full of bullets, though bodies is dropping. They ain't no stopping me. All of us are created equal. Constantly moving while making millions. Witnessing killings, leaving dead bodies in abandoned buildings. We are all created equal. Can't reach the children because they illin'. Addicted to killing and the appeal of the cat pillin'. The human rights of our citizens. Without feeling, but will they last or be blasted? Hard-headed bastard. Maybe he'll listen in this casket. You know, the system, folks, is rigged. We should all have the opportunity to to live up to our God-given potential. The economy is rigged. The banking system is rigged. There's a lot of things that are rigged in this world of ours. Sometimes I'm the watcher, sometimes I'm the participant. It's a rigged system. We are each endowed with certain inalienable rights. This was a dirty trick. These are dirty tricksters. And sometimes it's just allegories or fables. We're gonna change it. We're gonna change it fast. Every single American deserves to be treated equally in the eyes of the law and in the eyes of our society. It's a pretty simple proposition. Save me, but Jesus, 
nobody can't nobody can't nobody can't nobody can't nobody can't nobody can't nobody Donald Trump is here tonight. Now I know that he's taken some flack lately, but no one is happier, no one is prouder to put this birth certificate matter to rest than the Donald. And that's because he can finally get back to focusing on where are Biggie and Tupac? America is at an important crossroads. We were all swept away eight years ago when Barack Obama was elected president, for we knew that if a black man could become president, that there was no longer going to be racism in our society. How wrong we were to have believed that. Black Lives Matter. Why is it that every single black friend that I have has a cop story or a prosecutor's story about how they had their face put into the dirt or how they didn't receive justice. Blue Lives Matter. All of the first responders that wear their uniforms with honor and put their lives on the line for us deserve our respect. All lives matter. Chug Knight's life matters. Waymond Anderson's life matters. I think if we examine two cases, we get a glimpse into why we have a problem. There is no bigger bad boy than Marion Chug Knight. Chug is short for sugar bear. He grew up in Compton. He was a bodyguard a football player, and he founded Death Row Records. In 1996, there was an assassination attempt on Suge Knight. In the process, Tupac Shakur was shot. He lived for another six days, and according to his autopsy, he died from wounds he sustained the night Suge Knight was targeted. Later, Suge Knight would be blamed for the death of rapper Christopher Wallace. Witnesses in every case that testify take the oath that they are going to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. But do we hold investigators, judges, and prosecutors to the same standard. It looks like he uh, drove backwards and struck the victims and then went forward and struck them again as he left. The video clearly shows that Suge Knight did not back up over Terry Carter. It looks like he uh, drove backwards and struck the victims and then went forward and struck them again as he left. But this isn't the first time that the sheriffs have told lies about Suge Knight. In 1998, at the Universal Amphitheater, Snoop Doggy Dog was arrested, and he told sheriffs that Suge Knight was behind the murder of Tupac. Sheriffs would leak that document in spite of knowing that Suge Knight was in the car the night Tupac was shot, and that there's no way that Suge Knight was behind the murder. Very few documents have been leaked in the Tupac murder. It's curious that the sheriffs would leak this document. At the time, the judge was hearing Suge Knight's appeal. And why do things always trace back to the sheriffs? Could it be that the Compton police, who were found to be corrupt, were absorbed into the Los Angeles County sheriffs, and therefore, 
Suge is only attacked in places where the sheriffs will respond. They responded to the location at Tams. And not only would sheriffs respond to the One Oak nightclub where Suge Knight was shot six times, an off-duty sheriff is implicated in letting the shooters into the club that night and dropping them off at LAX the next morning. Could sheriffs be lying about Suge Knight to cover up their own misdeeds? Human rights are in peril. The deep rumblings that we hear today, the rumbling of discontent, is the thunder of disinherited masses rising from dungeons of oppression. It's a crooked system, folks. It's a crooked system. If Suge Knight is such a hardened criminal. Can't they find any evidence to convict him? Turns out Suge Knight has been being investigated since the early 90s, and most of those investigations have gone absolutely nowhere. This investigation, they have had to manufacture evidence against him. Danny, I need you to do Suge. I need you to do me a favor. He was asking him as a favor for Hall or Bill because he wasn't on the case. How did he come to you? Pivoting me out for Hall. Pivoting me out for Hall. Yeah. Because I, I, I didn't, I didn't, it's a high profile case, right? And me and Hall, like I said, me and I don't like Hall. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Hall, Hall says I'm egotistical, arrogant, I, you know what I mean? I, he just don't like, we don't like each other. We don't. Trying to get information to set up Suge Knight. No, I don't need information. I'm, I'm there. They're going to give me the information. I'm going to do Suge. I don't need Suge to talk. I just need my presence next to Suge. Okay. I don't need Suge to say nothing. Okay. He made me an agent of the state and the court. Right? Crazy shit. It was Brandenburg first. Brandenburg says, I want you to do me a favor, right? Work with Hall and do Suge, right? At the time, Hall wasn't even on the case. Hall promoted to lieutenant, came to the county jail. Richard was the, was the I.O. in the case, so I started working with Hall. When you say Richard, you mean Richard Biddle? Yeah. Okay. I started working with Hall and Biddle, right? Well, I don't, I don't like Biddle. I don't like him, right? So I said, don't bring him around me again, right? Mm -hmm. So I was dealing with Hall. Hall was trying to build a, a scenario on Shug where Shug's point of defense is going to be self-defense. In the beginning, in the murder book, there was two witnesses. One of her name is Her address is out of Whittier. She was present when all that happened. She said that one of the people involved had something that resembled a gun. That particular piece of evidence in the murder book never got turned over to Cindy so they couldn't make it part of the discovery where the defense couldn't get it. This was a dirty trick. These are dirty tricksters. My wife's nephew his name is Devin Gonzalez. He caught an attempted murder case in Palmdale and Lancaster. They tried to give him 70 to life. Hall told me that if I testify against Shug Knight and help Shug Knight, they would get the kid out of jail or cut him a deal, right? What's his name again? Devin Gonzalez. Of course, I told Hall I got you, right? They went, dropped all the charges and gave him six years. Right now, in division in Lancaster court, Catherine Blanchard being the judge. Hall did that because he thinks I'm doing shit. And they kicked him? <laughs> yeah, seven life. It, 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 look, look it up on the internet. So, Devin goes, oh, I got his booking number. They, they, get him, they gave him seven years? He had, he, they were facing seven to life. Okay. They dropped everything down, everything down, everything down, right? And he got six years. And so they tried to get an inmate to offer false, trumped up testimony on Suge Knight. Another inmate that was asked to testify against Suge Knight is Waymond Anderson, a.k.a. Suave. We know him as the singer in the late 80s that did the remake of My Girl. That song climbed to number 22 on the national charts and climbed to number one on the R&B charts. Here's what Suave had to say about Suge Knight. The following audio recording sole property of my production company, Suave First Production, and any use of this audio recording without having my written consent, or the purchase thereof this audio recording from me, Suave, for its use in any capacity, 
will be in direct violation of my copyright in this audio recording. Moreover, this audio recording in its entirety was assembled over several 15-minute collect phone calls that I made from prison to someone with the knowledge of utilizing advances that have been made in today's recording technology to omit the constant reminder from being heard of my calls being placed from a correctional institution. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. It's a crooked system, folks. It's a crooked system. This is stuff people can check on their own, so... My point and why I'm doing this today is to clear my name of people saying I said this or I said that when I'm a man. I stand up and use the bathroom when I use the bathroom. I'm not I'm not hiding from nobody, uh, and I'm just tired of all the lies. I got uh, intertwined with uh, Shug Knight in about uh, 2000. It could be late 1999. I received a visit at SADF, which is Oakland Two State Prison in Fresno, California from special agents that flew out from New York. Uh, they entered uh, into the visiting room at the prison. Uh, I did not know what they were there to see me for, and it was through this agent named Todd Holliday uh, that I learned um, a cell phone in my name of Wayman Anderson was found inside of death row records. On the night of the murder of Christopher Wallace, I was told by the agent that the cell phone in my name that they found inside of death row records uh, when they served a search warrant on his record label, I uh, made phone calls on March the 9th, 1997, uh, near the Peterson Museum. During the interview, uh, they did not take that they had uh, what I would call a, a yellow a legal pad with them. And they were using the legal pad to write down information. And they basically told me that if I was to uh, confirm uh, that Mary and Sheila Knight had something to do with the murder of Christopher Wallace, uh, that they were walking out of prison. And I just looked at them. I wasn't going to lie on sure, but because I had been lied on, and I know exactly what that feels like. Judge Ryan, uh, you know, in, in, in law, uh, once a defendant is convicted in post-conviction, we prove what's called a prima facie case, meaning the district attorney had to refute the evidence that we put forth. They not only denied the writ, but they rejected Bishop Philip Coleman's who died a month before my evidential hearing, the judge stated, he told not my investigator, the district attorney's investigator flew to Jackson, Mississippi before Bishop died. And Judge Wyatt said the Bishop's statement was hearsay. He told the district attorney, I met this man one time in my life. He told the district attorney's investigators that I was with him in Jackson, Mississippi when the crime occurred. Judge Ryan said, that it was hearsay. Now, Don Vincent had my case moved to Judge Ryan's courtroom, and he told me he was going to do it. I was in Peter Espinola's courtroom. I sent you the motion. Again, Judge Ryan denied evidence that the district attorney went and got. How is that hearsay? You know, I, I keep myself all the time because when Larry Longo was representing me, you know, they lied and said, I said this about Larry Longo. This whole district attorney's office in Los Angeles, in fact, the whole justice system, is just nothing but a big old charade. They do something called case trading. They go after who they want to go after. They have unlimited resources. And when your number come up, they're coming at you with all tricks in the book. And Larry Longo warned me about that. It's a crooked system, folks. It's a crooked system. There, there is no bigger crooks than the crooks wearing black robes who deny evidence like Judge Ryan, uh, and they have certain judges that they place their cases before, because going back to Corpus State Prison, uh, when a special agent Todd Holliday came to see me, he told me that he could place my case before a judge that would let me walk if I lied and basically verify what they wanted me to say about Shug Knight, that this Walter Johnson, King Tut, whatever you want to call himself, was you know supposedly saying up in New York. I ain't got no lies to tell about Shug. I know Shug from Galaxy Studios and from uh, Bobby Brown when he was his bodyguard. Uh, I was very close to Elton, uh, very close to Terry Carter. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, I, I just want the truth to be out there. Don't say that I, Wayne and Anderson Joseph, a.k.a. Suave, originally go by way out, said something about Shug that's just not the truth. We, we never even ran in the same... A function. He represented something red. I represented something blue. So, I mean, how would I know that man's business? Let's let, let's let's be truthful about all this. 
But what I'm not going to do is lie on somebody like people have lied on me and let the man lose his life like I lost mine for 23 years now and count for something he didn't do. Now, whatever he may have did, I don't know anything about that. But all I can do is speak about what I know. And again, he had nothing to do with Christian Wallace's murder, nor did Sean Combs, Puffy, P. Diddy, whatever he wants to call himself, have anything to do with Tupac Shakur's murder. We as black people need to start waking up and let this, this BS uh, and, and what these individuals are doing in the supposed greatest justice system in the world uh, and start rectifying uh, what's really going on in this country. And that is black men getting put away and abused and, and put back in slavery uh, through now it's the new Jim Crow, which is this prison system. So, uh, you know, uh, Judge Ryan is, is uh, I don't even know, you know, how that man sits, still sits on the bench today. Uh, you've seen the evidence of, uh, we've now gathered of, of the uh, tapes and proof of perjury by the district attorney and by the uh, lead investigator. Uh, we now know uh, that Judge Ryan, he built his judgeship uh, off of uh, doing cases in the city attorney's office. Uh, I received uh, an evidential hearing in 2008 from the Second District Appellate Court. And when I won my evidential hearing, I was originally placed in Judge Peter Espinosa's courtroom. Uh, then all of a sudden, uh, when this same cell phone came up, I was subpoenaed to testify in the Christopher Wallace uh, civil litigation case uh, that Perry Sanders and the Wallace family uh, brought against the city of Los Angeles. And as soon as I was uh, subpoenaed, all of a sudden my case was taken out of Peter Espinosa's courtroom and sent to Judge William Ryan's courtroom, where uh, eventually my uh, writ of habeas corpus was denied uh, because I told the truth uh, in the hearing that I was threatened by City Attorney Don Vincent that if I was to say that the uh, same police officers who my prosecutor who prosecuted me that walk and speaking of Rafael Perez had something to do with Christopher's murder, that I would spend the rest of my life in prison. And if I said that uh, any LAPD officers had anything to do with Christopher Wallace's murder, I would spend the rest of my life in prison. I was also threatened by several other LAPD officers who wanted the narrative to be that the murder of Christopher Wallace was orchestrated and paid for by Shiv Knight, which was a lie. And so I was basically went in the courtroom and they wanted me to lie and say that uh, Mrs. Wallace uh, and Terry Sanders had offered me money uh, to lie and say that police officers were involved with uh, the murder of Christopher Wallace. And I told the truth. And from telling the truth, my writ was denied uh, in Judge Ryan's courtroom. Don Vincent was the, uh, the city attorney uh, who was originally assigned to handle the civil litigation for the city to defend the city in Christopher Wallace's lawsuit. Uh, I was um, in my cell one day, again, at Sadat State Prison in Fresno, California, and I was called to my counselor's office, and he told me that there was an official from Los Angeles uh, that worked in the city attorney's office wanted to speak with me on the phone. Uh, I got on the telephone with this individual, and he identified his name to me as Don Vincent. He told me that I was going to be subpoenaed uh, for um, the same cell phone being filed that the attorneys representing the Wallace family wanted to question me about that cell phone and about my knowledge of officers being involved with the Wallace uh, murder. Uh, he eventually told me that he was going to come out and see me, but he never came. We had subsequent phone calls, maybe five or six phone calls, maybe even more. And the, as each phone call came, he was basically providing me information and, and threatened me and told me that I would be placed in what's called a shoe in prison and I wouldn't receive any mail, visits, or anything if I did not testify the way that he wanted me to testify in the deposition that was held at Cork and State Prison. Uh, so out of fear of being placed in the shoe, uh, I was going through a very uh, trying time at the time with, with family issues. I'm now divorced and so I have nothing else to lose. Uh, but at the time, all I had left was my, my son and, and my wife. So I basically, uh, out of fear, testified the way that Don Vincent wanted me to testify uh, in that deposition, where he told me that I would then would be placed in the shoe, which is at Pelican Bay, uh, and that I would never see the light of day, and I would spend the rest of my life in prison if I was to say anyone else besides Shug Knight uh, had anything to do with the murders of Christopher Wallace and the South Side Compton Crips. That's what their narrative wanted to be. Uh, 
trade assets at the Crips, and they should not have something to do with Christian Wallace's murder for the retaliation of Tupac Shakur. And I never signed that deposition. I never uh, seen the deposition. I went in that room and testified exactly how Don Vincent told me to testify. Because the power they have on an individual in custody is not even, you can't even imagine what they could do to the person that's in my position. But again, I got nothing else to lose. I got stage four throat, throat cancer. And there's nothing these people can do to me anymore. Uh, Russell Poole, I think it was in 1997. Uh, maybe July, June, uh, he uh, we got what they call a removal order. Uh, he took me out of the county jail and moved me to Parker Center. And while I was at Parker Center, I was threatened by Rafael Perez in the cell. We learned about 2000, 2000, 2001, that on September 18, 1993, uh, when the crime occurred that I'm now in prison for supposedly committing, uh, that I was in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, sitting inside of the office of a bishop, one of the most renowned bishops in the history of the state of Jackson, Mississippi, uh, named Bishop Philip Coleman. Uh, I was inside of Bishop Philip Coleman's office with him at about the same time the murder was occurring uh, here in Los Angeles. So it would have been impossible for me to be uh, involved with the crime. But not only that, on the day that I was arrested, five months after the crime, on January 29, 1994, uh, I told uh, Detective Anderson uh, more than once that I believed that I was out of town. And when he arrested me, he seized my credit cards. Uh, and it turns out that the same credit cards that he seized from me and placed into evidence in 2000, 2001, one of those credit cards, my Diner Club International credit card, more specifically, that specific uh, credit card uh, turned uh, information to one of my investigators that I was in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, so that credit card that they took from me on the day that I was arrested turned out to have the airline ticket on it that I purchased to fly to Jackson, Mississippi on September the 14th. So I left four days before the murder even happened. I stayed in Jackson, Mississippi from September the 14th to the 22nd. And there are several alibi witnesses who saw me in Jackson, Mississippi. But because the prosecutor who prosecuted me was also the lead prosecutor on Rafael Perez's case. I sit in prison today for information that they know that I'm aware of uh, because they came to me, as I've told you before, uh, in uh, around, I'd say, March the 20th of 1997. And Detective Anderson, the lead investigator on my case, had been taking my phone calls from the county jail. And so he had intercepted several phone calls. We now have proof that those conversations were intercepted. But because of what's on those tapes, I sit in prison for a crime that I didn't have, have anything to do with. I've lost 23 years of my life for something I had nothing, I repeat again, nothing to do with. We've uncovered a document, the same document, that proves that they have taped conversations between me and other individuals' names who have always been mentioned in Christopher's murder, talking while I was in the county jail, and we now have proof that the individual that she came into the courtroom in 2008 and said, I made this witness up. We now have proof that she negotiated take phone calls and visits to be tape recorded. And she got on the stand in 2008 and stated that she believed that I made this individual up. We now have independent witnesses who can verify that there was a visit that took place that she had the tape of, of this person now. So she lied on the stand. Not only did she lie, but the lead investigator verified her lie on the stand. And so this document, dated March, I believe, 26 of 1997, was generated by now a judge. His name is Mark Sutton. He used to be my attorney, but he's now a judge. So there's no way for her to back out of this now and say, she didn't, you know, she made an error or she just, uh, you know, maybe forgot or nonchalantly, you know, it's been so long. She straight out committed perjury because she's covering her butt because of my co-defendant. She let him go uh, and, you know, maybe he was released and went out and did other crimes. So she, you know, her career would be ruined behind this. But I, I just want to say on this tape and want everybody to hear this, that she and I had nothing to do with Christopher Wallace's murder, nor did... Sean Combs had anything to do with Tupac Shakur's murder. There are tapes that the district attorney office has in Los Angeles that 
spells out who was involved with those murders. Not that I come on those tapes saying I had anything to do with the murders, but I was on phone conversations with the individuals who laid out the murder on tape, and they came to me and asked me to reveal to them because they said to those people, I knew their uh, modus operandi, and they wanted me to say what they were saying on those tapes to me in code. So, you know, this is nothing that I'm saying. I didn't know that they were intercepting my phone calls, but they came to me after they intercepted the phone call. So now we have the document to prove it. So let's chip fall when it may. But my point in this is, is that people have lied and said, I said this about sure, they said this and that. And that's just a damn lie. I ain't signed no deposition. I was threatened into doing that deposition. Sure had nothing to do with nobody's paying me to say anything. I don't have anything but who I am, and I'm a man. And so I'm just speaking the truth. Sure had nothing to do with Christopher Wallace's murder, nor did Sean Combs or Puffy or whatever name you go by now, had anything to do with Tupac Shakur's murder. You know, the free press is central to our democracy, and nah, I'm just kidding. You know I've got to talk about Trump. <laughs> Come on. We weren't just going to stop there. Come on. 